Oh, boy. All right. Refresh the chat just to make sure that that's going on. Can I type eight ball? Are we live yet? Yes! Ha-ha! <laughs> and the eight ball says sure. All right, cool. Um, all right, no one's, no one's in chat yet, but I'm just going to do this anyway, so. Hello and welcome. We are continuing through the monster manual. We are, we've, last time we did the double A Aarakocra. Today we are doing, <laughs> we are in the AB. So we are now in the Aboleth area. And I'm more <laughs> excited for this one because the Aboleth is... Well, once upon a time it looked more like a fish, but nowadays it looks more like just an abstract otherworldly creature, and that's more exciting to me because I can just make abstract shapes with fishtails and tendrils, and I can just say, that's it, that's the one. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and again with me today is Ethan Starr. And hi, hi. Providing more of a professional touch. He is going to be doing the sketchings, and I'm going to be doing um, the modeling and sculpting and stuff. Uh, modeling an Abolith. Like, thinking, like, I don't know, fashion model. It's really weird. What are you wearing right now? Oh, I'm wearing Abolith. <laughs> the Eldritch Starks. So, um, while we are waiting for people to potentially come in even though art is probably the mo one of the most dead <laughs> one of the more dead categories on twitch um why don't we explain what an aboleth is to the space and we'll just continue on from there so do you want to do the explanation or should i Oh, it's crazy. They I guess we could take turns with what we know. Aboleth, what I had like read and heard, I think it's a weird ass thing. The fact that it's supposed to be a really powerful psychic creature that lived in the primordial seas of existence before the gods took over. And eventually the gods decided that, like, hey, this, uh, um, realms are kind of cool and so they took over and destroyed the Aboleth Empire freed is the term that they use but I don't know that seems debatable but freed the creatures that were uh, the slaves that belonged to the Aboleth then um, shunted the Aboleth into the deepest darkest areas of existence or at least those are the ones that survived uh, and what's amazing about the Aboleths uh, kind of, or at least one thing, is that they are almost unkillable, or when they get killed, their consciousness goes to a place that's safe and reforms its body around it, and they have perfect memory. They have perfect memory of how the gods screwed them over. They're just planning revenge, mm -hmm. um, in like the current era of things. Tyler, you can add more to it. All right, so... Um, I'll just fill in the blanks of what I think is interesting that I don't think you quite got. So I'm on D&D &D Beyond. Hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> um, Yet. Yeah, so these creatures are categorized as large. So, you know, whenever I hear Aboleths and people talk about them and their, you know, and how they were like they were the first and they were the they, they they were the enslavers of all you know i always imagined this like like this house-sized creature you know like a thing that could possibly be like kaiju status it's a large creature this thing is the size of a horse <laughs> and i love that's the the like i don't know the thing that we must have been given in like uh 
3.5 when we started like uh, of like size category things <laughs> that's what i always use uh, like when i describe horse or like uh large size things i'm like think horse size yeah, it's big it's... but at the same time like you don't see a horse and go ah oh my god <laughs> you've got some history <laughs> yeah it seems kind of unfair like do they actually categorize a moose in D D? no they don't but I think if they were to, I feel like a moose should be huge, <laughs> not large. Um, anyways, weird tangent. So, yeah, so they say that um, before the coming of the gods, Abelus lurked in the primordial oceans and underground lakes. They reached out with their minds and seized control of the, God, I hate this word, burgeoning? Burgeoning <laughs> life forms of the mortal realm, making those creatures their slaves. Their dominance made them like gods. Then the true gods appeared, smashing the Abolith Empire and freeing their slaves. Yeah, that seems very like written by the winners of history, not like <laughs> not I... like the not like the third party like um you know, not like some alien species that are just kind of like writing down notes of like, oh, and then this other, these other, these other godlike creatures came in and like removed them from the area. Um, yeah, they seem to share a lot of, um, they seem to share a lot of features with other kind of creatures in the D and D like mythos. So like, true, the Aboleths don't tech like, um, their memories I think pass on to another person. So it's not really so much like they are, like, the y the younger one like the the newer ones i don't even know if they really breed i think they just kind of e begin to exist um they uh it's more or less like the the memory the memory of revenge comes in and so they're like yeah that that makes sense i'm going to totally like take back the land that was that was ours um, it also seems kind of weird that it's like this this once godlike creature is pretty much just like you're a lake you're a lake monster now <laughs> uh oh did we crash oh okay I think it's it's very strange and like I don't know how much you want to do research on it um, specifically those people that are out there in internet land but there was a person that I like watch on like YouTube. I think Mr. Rex. I guess I can draw that out mildly for a little bit. But they do have done like uh, research on the different different D and D creatures, and they look through like from like like first edition all the way up to fifth edition and even do sometimes like research about the creatures if the creatures actually existed in other lores uh to kind of like find something in between but um i think they were saying that like they're they do kind of i don't know it's like a breed and pass on my existence to a new version of myself so they're like they're their children, or more or less their clone, and they just die after they make a clone of themselves. <laughs> um, they just, I don't know. It's like a new version of oneself, but like really, I don't know how much I'm like like my high school self. So <laughs> we're always changing, so I'm not too sh shooken up by it. I think one thing that like is really weird that if you like dig, or at least I found out through um, watching Mr. Rex uh, Abolith Secrets um, and I think confirmed in a couple other things is that they have like perfect memory of almost every creature in existence um, 
because they were there and they have like eidetic memory and when they eat creatures they take that creature's memories as well so uh, i like remember those perfectly but it knows almost every creature's origin it, like it watched those things start to evolve and gain power and become godlike or snuff out of existence except for the mind flayers <laughs> And so they know of Mind Flayers now, but they don't know how the Mind Flayers started. And I think that's such a cool, weird thing <laughs> in their story. That was like, I don't know if it's like covered in another thing, but it's definitely um, a good opening to like a DD and d or an opening spot for somebody that might want to make something of it in a DD and d story. Yeah, All under this, I like, I don't uh, think I don't. Uh, I really don't want to look that up because that's another. <laughs> that's another. That's another hole that I could fall into. But um, cause I don't think mind flares are really all that old. Like I don't think they're that old of a creature. I think they're relatively new. And so the description that I have is that their memories are flawless in primordial things. So yeah, they were watching. They were watching the dwarves and the elves kind of grow up from these, like, um, you know, previous iteration type stuff. But the Mind Flayers were like, you know, some something else that was kind of a little newer. <laughs> or they might have started off as something different and then eventually they became the weirdness that is what they are now. Mm -hmm. I feel like person that I was watching was postulating that it's pos that it was possible that the mind flayers evolved from aboliths like a distant future but then travel uh, like enslaved traveled th back in time and a whole variety of weirdness oh, I don't know what's funny going on. thing I'm still not all that great with the snake hook tool <laughs> I don't fully understand what I'm doing with it. I guess I could do it this way, and then I can just grab and... Yeah, that's semi-better. I can make another one up here. Then I can get the grab tool. Um, there was one, let me see, it's in the, there, there, there is a written attempt to have the hero, the heroes of a campaign, like, interact with an aboleth, and it's in the, um, Princes of the Apocalypse campaign, but it's just, it's so, it, it's so out of the way that the only way, like, there's, there's two scenarios in which, um, the dm could ever have the players interact with those things and that's a if they chose to go to that particular temple like really early on when the characters are like relatively lower level so that they fail the um the enslave feature <laughs> there's a there's a uh, no the telepathy or something there's something that so the enslave thing only works within 30 feet so the Abolith has to kind of like talk to and coax creatures from like a farther distance and just be like, yeah, you know, come a little, you know, come a little closer. I got secrets to tell. And then once it's in, within 30 feet, it's like mine. <laughs> um, so failing, so failing all that interaction could possibly be it. But, you know, because the thing is that you're, you're walking through this cave, right? And then there's like this brit, this rickety kind of bridge that can hold, you know, a, you know like a relatively large creature um so there's no real danger unless someone like cuts the rope but then why <laughs> um <laughs> that's a lot of dnd &D. why how'd you do it yeah um rolled a one i had to man <laughs> <laughs> but um what's it the uh the lake is like like a hundred or something feet below this below this 
um, this bridge. So all you can really get are like these little like telepathic blips every once in a while of like, um, kid, I have candy. Like, kid, you know, like I know where you're going, or like I know your mom. Um, <laughs> and because uh, it has this thing called probing telepathy and it's like if a creature communicates tele uh, telepathically with the aboleth the aboleth learns the creature's greatest greatest desires if um, the aboleth can see oh uh, that's weird that's a double huh if a creature communicates tele telepathically with the aboleth the aboleth learns the creature's greatest desires if the aboleth can see the can see the creature. That's a weird double requisite. <laughs> um, but anyways, so it's like, sure, but I don't want to like fall 150 feet to do that. So I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing. You know, it's like it's easily ignorable. Um, I think you do like. Given the scenarios of things, I think it would be great to know or to not know that an abolith is, or anything about an abolith. Like, I don't know why anyone trusts talking fish like things. But, like, if you were told of a great sage of the sea that, uh, that knows all things about history, like, yeah, you could search that out and, like, yeah, like, make and it. I think that like... would be a neat thing. Yeah, like make it, make it a challenge that the that the heroes have to kind of confront, you know, put themselves in the danger of in order to like glean something, to help progress their thing. Like an avatar, Cole the Face Stealer, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that would be definitely it, because like he was, uh, he was going to him because Ko is like really ancient and knows all things. Yeah, want your face? Abolith just wants to tickle you until you become slave that that concept's been in um in a lot of greek mythology too where it's like you know a, a dude needs to go to this you know to this mythical creature for like information or like a hint as to like where to go next you know or something and but you know and then his plan is to get that information and then leave but that creature doesn't want him to leave in fact he wants him to stay there forever Forever. <laughs> Those horror stories always kind of get to me a little more than other things. Where it's just like, yeah, I don't want, I don't want to eat you. I don't want to like, I don't want to eat you, or I don't want to kill you. I just want to keep you. <laughs> I hate it. Um. Yeah, and then the other, the other scenario that you that could happen if to have the dm direct the the players toward the aboleth is if he's playing with a group of treasure seekers you know they have to clear out every single visible inch of this dungeon for every little shiny thing you know uh, so like... murder hobos <laughs> but it's like you know the the thing that the thing about the Prince of the Apocalypse, though, is that those dungeons are massive. Like, just to clear out one dungeon would probably take like two sessions, or maybe even three. Unless the DM likes to just like fast forward a lot of stuff and just be like, you you walk into this room and you see a treasure chest. You open it and it's you know this much gold. Cool. Next room. <laughs> and I think something that is not done very well um or and it's hard to do is to get that sense that like you can just live and sleep in dungeons that this is so massive and you feel like how how time is progressing but you also feel safe enough to think that like like you know i, I could you could stay here for a while and then like go clear out the next section if you went to like a I don't know. It would still have to be a lot larger than a mega mall. But if you went to a mega mall, or like, oh, okay, well, we can go to every single place and loot every single. Or, well, that's gonna take us a while. But you know, if we make a base camp in the <laughs> store of your choice, that's gonna work.
But I guess that's partly, partially what I'm drawing right now is I'm thinking about that, like that moment of when you go see the Adelaide hoaxing you. And I think it's interesting because it's remind, like, I just, if it's at the lake surface, it's the little face tentacles reaching out and, um, oh, wanting to touch you and to diseaseify you, which is a neat concept of the Aboleth, is the concept that it has this weird mucus of, that covers its entire body um, and almost creates like an area around it. And if you touch this mucus thing, it uh, you become diseased. And the disease is actually not that bad. I mean, it, it's terrible, but all it does is it encourages you to be in water. That's about all. Um, and it encourages you to be in water by making you only breathe water uh, or become a water breather. And while you're out of water and if you get too dry, you effectively take like acid damage and stuff. But that's about all. Um, but once you're in water, you're so much more in its domain and it makes it so much easier to be able to attack or get close to you and take over your mind with its other abilities. Which I find is very neat, nasty. Um, let's see. I think I want this to be fatter. I guess I could just move it. Let's just move this. Ah. The drawing that I'm doing is reminding me of the Elder Scrolls demon god Hermaeus Mora, particularly when we're identifying that this thing knows, can know all things that ha ever have been, falls in line with the Hor Hermaeus Mora being like a demon god of secret knowledges. Have you ever played in a campaign that had an Aboleth? Oh, and in fact, I, I think you and I started that um, that Prince of the Apocalypse went together before I left to do uh, run a different campaign for somebody. Mm. Um, I never got that chance to see that. Yeah, I think the reason why we run into a lot of unnecessary things is because... Um, one of our players really enjoys playing the dumb guy. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like, oh, you heard whispers? Well, we should go check that out. <laughs> but I think it also, I think it was relatively, that, that instant, that particular instance was relatively appropriate because it was just like, um, you know, because he was playing sort of like a noble-ish kind of character. It was like, you're hearing whispers? They know secrets? Like, we should probably figure that out. Otherwise, you know, those secrets could be used against us. <laughs> if I remember correctly. I don't... I don't remember why we ended up... We did end up fighting that Aboleth, though. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. Um, kind of jealous. I haven't, like... It's stuck in the DM role a lot, and so I don't get to um, get to kind of like uh, what is that? To to fight lo high leveled creatures. <laughs> like I think mostly I get to uh, like uh, be in people's like one shots, and I, I get to experience low level creatures a whole bunch. Like I've got tons of experience with goblins and kobolds. <laughs> But Aboleths, those are that was scary. I think that's an experience that a lot of people need to have more of is how to deal with those smaller creatures. 
because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, I always wanted to write up a campaign where, um, like the beginning is nothing but kobolds and goblins, and then the middle has like all these like, um, mid tier monsters like ogres and like other kind of stuff, but then the final tier the the final chapter doesn't have a like a bunch of like epic level monsters it just has like the the kobolds and the goblins make a return but you know the you know you change them so that suddenly they are really epic characters <laughs> you know they're hmm. they're an epic challenge but it's it's hard to write a character that's inherently weak to be better to have evolved so that they can fight, you know, a level 13 cleric or something. And that's part of, like, which is weird because you, as a player character, and a tanky paladin kobold, if you want to, and level up and get to level 13 and be a formidable thing, right? The illusion seems to break down so much more when it's NPCs and stuff. And it's kind of a nightmare. Though, there are rules for, like, hordes and stuff, but you could go about, like, making hordes of creatures. Yeah. So you'd fight, like, a whole pack of kobolds at a time as they try to overrun, uh, overrun you and city and blah, 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 blah. You know, I think they, um, the other thing too that was interesting in the transition from 5th edition or f um, 3.5 to 5th edition was the description of the Kraken. So, in talking on the Abolith enslavement feature, um, in 3.5, the Kraken did a very similar thing in which it just kind of kept colonies of things in these like underground or you know, these underground um, water-like areas, and it would just kind of come back and just, like, be worshipped for, like, three like three weeks and then just disappear. Um, they kind of change... I don't, I don't remember seeing that same description anymore, so I think they might have changed that to give the Abolith more um, identity. Because in 3.5, there was like very little distinction between what the Kraken did and what the Abolith did, except the Kraken seemed more epic just because it was an actually like gargantuan creature, <laughs> whereas the Abolith was still like a small little tiny creature. It was just like, well, why is this? Why is this creature like a like a proto god, and the Kraken is just a like a beast? It's <laughs> just a mythical beast. No, that don't make any sense. <sighs> Do I make the mouth now? Even dig dig way deep into your into your art schooling. When you're dealing with clay and you're and you need to make a mouth, do you make it like later or do you just like make a hole and you just say that's going to be the mouth eventually? <laughs> I like I like do making the hole first and saying like that's going to be a mouth uh, and trying to give myself some room for things like to like sculpt over it and uh, add bits of flesh and things because then it helps me visually uh, think about where other stuff is going to go. The other thing that's really good practice, like if a DM decides to use an Aboleth, the other thing that's really cool um, 
or really good practice for the DM to do um, because they're using an Apolith is the concept that a creature doesn't have to fight to the death. Like an Apolith is smart enough to just be like, all right, these these creatures have the modern gods on their side and they keep burning me in my eyeballs. So I'm just going to be like, all right, all right, you can leave. <laughs> I, I'm just going to sink into my, I'm just going to sink into my lake and just let you guys go. Hmm. But I'll remember this. <laughs> thing that I think is weird, not completely Abolith style, since they haven't really. I don't. I don't know. We didn't run into anything that was saying anything about its personality besides it's very patient and very angry at the gods. But it seems sentient enough to not really give a shit about like how um, the regular mortals do things, besides being pawns for it. Um, but when we were reading about. I was reading up on the. Rakshasa, um, this like fiend, it was saying that this thing, I was reading a couple fiends that said similar things, that like when you kill one, it just reforms back in hell, or whatever hell or abyss that it comes from. And it often will plot its revenge and take out its revenge on like the descendants of the person that like killed it or slighted it. Yep. Uh, which I think is a hilarious thing of like uh, in a lot of, I don't know, old mythos and stuff, like you're cursed because something your ancestors did. And I think that'd be a weird thing to start off like, yeah, I think there's a demon that's trying to kill me. I don't, I'm not sure why, and I need to find out what Grandpa did so I can know how to get over this or how to say I'm sorry. So I kind of messed up a bunch of stuff and everything's kind of wonked out. <laughs> like everything's kind of on a tilt. And I wish I'd started cleaner. So that we got I'm time, we can start over. My axis, axes. I think I would actually love to start off a story with an abolith, or not start the story, but have it relatively early on, and have it be like an ally. More than I'm thinking about this, uh, I think it'd be funny, and it would be interesting to like start learning, even if it's like helping uh, religious characters and characters that would be pro. Uh, pro the gods that took over its land, but trying to gain information, trying to gain that edge. Like, and then you have to make that decision later of like, do you like your your patron, friend, that quirky, weird um, eyeball that likes to come out of like any watery place uh, and has been giving you aid and help more than you like what thing it's possibly scheming? And it's hard because you can, I don't know, you suffer the, like, you know that you are being charmed to do things in D&D. But I think in a variety of um, different shows and movies and stuff where, like, people take over their other people's minds, I think a lot of people have that issue of, like, I don't know, was it them or was it me? Did I have that inside that thought and that idea inside me this entire time? I was just waiting for a moment to push me over the edge, and um, maybe the Adolith was that moment. Uh... It'd be interesting dealing with that of like everyone has fallen under the sway of the Adolith's and control at some point and done something that they're not too happy about but putting it back on themselves that like no i'm not sure if it's the abolith that really wanted that forced me to do it some good role players for that mm -hmm. oh and it's at a friggin incline too god dang it <laughs> i suck Okay, hold on. Uh, what do you end up using in your Abolith? 
how would I? You want to, yeah. Um, I'd probably use it how I described the Grecian tale earlier, where it's kind of, it's this, it's this kind of unavoidable like challenge that the players don't want to go towards, but it's like they could avoid it. Or they can hold it off, but they can't avoid it type of a thing, you know? It's like eventually they're going to have to go to this thing for information because they're just going to be missing, like, one clue and it's going to bug them for forever. Or they can get it wrong and just, you know, go straight to hell or something, but... <laughs> um, but I do like that... Um, it's not really a trope. What is that called? That story tool machine i want to avoid saying gimmick but you know that mm -hmm. that um just alluding back to the co the face stealer thing because i don't i don't believe ang needed to go to him did he not necessarily um but they were in a crunch they were trying to find out i think at that episode like what happened to like uh, gods of the god of the moon, or does that exist so that they could help fight out, fight off the fire nation in the northern water tribe? It was happening like right then. That's what it was. Is that what it was? I think it was very much like this is hap like we're dealing with an issue like war right now, and I need to find a powerful ally. I guess so. So it went. Hmm. Yeah, I always I always misplace where that episode falls into because I know because I know they were because I know they were they were heading to the Northern Water Tribe just anyway, but I don't remember why. And Ko is the one that told him that the the water spirit was like just a normal like it looks like a normal thing, right? Is that him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just it was just weird to me because that that scene was weird. I mean, but that's that kind of falls into my the the same thing where it was like it's just kind of weird to me that um they needed that that ang needed to do that like that seemed so very optional because if they were headed toward the northern water tribe anyway then the, the thing was if they were at the northern water tribe and he was the one that told them that like you've seen these these gods before they're the fish in the pond oh the... he was just sitting there <laughs> that's right i forgot about that yeah. And they just weren't they weren't aware that those fish were more than just symbolic things. That's right. <sighs> I know all of these different like ways to manipulate stuff in this program. And now I've come to the unfortunate point where I need to sit down and just be like, okay, how does an eyelid work? <laughs> In high school, I'm just like, I don't know that I'm doing a great job right now about it because I'm being very sketchy and talking, but um, I took uh, an anatomy course I wanted that that sort of knowledge in my art belt of like, oh yeah, that's how that's what those things do. Or this thing can only move this much. And you would usually have a fat layer here, so that's kinda like this. Yeah, it's weird. The the image that um wizards provided for D and D beyond isn't like that great 
Oh, personally, I like the 3.5 oh, version fish. of the Abolith. The fish? And <laughs> I want to say... There's... 0.5 and the 4th edition, I think, were pretty cool um, versions of it. 5th edition, like, yeah, I don't know. You're digging on the alien Eldritch Horror thing a little bit more than I am, but to me... It's just some noodle thing with, like, a drill mouth. <laughs> All right, let's try just building it out first. And then let's carve away. Let's try that. Like right now, this looks like a demon koi kite. Damn it, there's a specific name for those things, isn't there? Probably. <sighs> really? Okay. Koi nobody. It means a carp stream. So they're not technically a kite. It's technically considered a streamer. Makes sense. Huh. Interesting. I think the coolest variation of that that I've seen um, that incorporates a a like more recent cultural phenomenon, like back in the day when I first saw it, was the Gyarados version of it. Hmm. I was just like, yes, that's awesome. Because they also had the Magic Carp version of it, you know? Because it's like, well, that's obvious. But then it's just so cool how it was so easy. Well, actually, I should reverse that. Because now that I think about it, the Gyarados was kind of based after the kite. And they were like, well, now we know what its pre evolution is is the, this magic, this koi. <laughs> is how it goes in my head because i think that was a question to a lot of american people for a long time was why does this why does this useless fish turn to this uh, turn into this awesome dragon mm -hmm. and it's like well because the dragon looks like they're streamers and the streamers were traditionally these koi looking things it bugs me how the the image kind of looks like it doesn't have, like they don't even bother with like lower eyelids. It's just like the upper eyelid is the lower eyelid and this thing doesn't blink ever. <laughs> mm. Which I guess it wouldn't need to blink if it's constantly in water. And covered by a layer of its own mucus. Yeah, and that's the other thing too, is that you don't ever, there's a lot of creatures in D&D that you look at and you go, oh, that's kind of, that's kind of cool. You read the description and you go, oh, that's kind of creepy. And then you don't really read like its abilities or its effects. And so you don't really get the, gr the, the gist that it's like this gross slimy creature. It just kind of is the scaly looking kind of thing. And then it starts doing things and you're like, ew, wait, what? <laughs> That's what it that's what it's doing? That's gross. <laughs> Why? Hmm. It's got like these gill things. Hmm. I wonder if I should add whiskers now or add whiskers later. <laughs> wow, my abolith has a really long body. Let's try remeshing it real quick. See if we can get a little more detail out of my out of my voxels. Ah. 
So like I got I got kind of angry because three days ago I tried to make a um, I tried to practice my particle system and my hair stuff so that mm. one day maybe mm. I can go back to the um, to the Aarakocra and like add some feathers to it, but in like a quick fast manner. And so one of the ways that I can target where I want hair and where I don't want hair is to go into this whole texture painting thing and like do a heat map and like tell it okay so where it's hot is where I want fur and where it's cold is where I don't want any fur um, but I guess I was doing something wrong or something because um, whenever I would try to like just do something as small as like the nose as like you know cold um, the entire program and my computer would just lock up and just like freeze and I was just like oh no <laughs> my nightmare <laughs> don't want to be hairy I could definitely seen a couple of designs where the eyes are like instead of stacked on top of each other as like a weird cyclops thing that they have like that they have been more like spider orientations. Prince uh from Abolith to Abolith. Yeah, because doesn't the fish have more of a spider, like more of a spider thing going on? Uh, I don't think so. Let's see, what were old versions of this? It's interesting like that I made and one stacked. eye look angry, one eye look neutral, and one eye look surprised. <laughs> that would be way too much detail to put into a relatively minor like character or minor creature. In my like in my experience of how D and D or DMs in the past have used aboleths is um as a minor creature, but um to actually give it a multi like a multi personality disorder thing because of all of its memories. And so one eye represents one <laughs> type of like, you know, one expression or one opinion. It's weird. Maybe. Actually, a lot of these are have like stacked versions, but I see a couple that are different. I think what you might re be remembering is that it has these two weird large like pits on the side of its head and i i want to say that's kind of like where the mucus comes from or something like that yeah. give it more you want more cowbell well we ask for more eyebrow of this eyeball thing not the best but I've also this is like my second time trying to do eyeball things <sighs>
Let's see if I can try to get fancy with the mouth. Let's try to do some mouth stuff. <laughs> so I've seen people when they do, when they do like um, animal sculpts and stuff, they tend to make the mouth empty and they fill it in with a secondary, like with a secondary uh, object. Oh yeah, like teeth. Yeah. Like. Uh, well, so like the uh, secondary object is like the gums, and then they put in the teeth as like a third, like a third layer, like a third object. So they're all kind of separated. Um, let's see if I can do something like that. Let's do another UV sphere, I guess. Because I can't look at his like open, creepy mouth anymore. It's like too creepy. Ah, <laughs> This looks like a filter feeder. That's not what I want. Uh oh. User perspective. I want orthographic, right? Nope, even that's wrong. Uh oh, I did the thing. The thing. I did the thing. I'm in a rotate. I'm in a rotate mode instead of a. <laughs> it's fun listening. Like, I have no clue what the hell you're talking about at the moment. Fine. Oops, that's wrong. Oops. <laughs> what the heck? What did I connect that to then? Yeah. Phil, nope, that's wrong. mute myself real quick just so that uh <laughs> it's not a call it's not a lot of yappy yap now i just get to squeak Aboliths are such a weird thing in the fact that, like, I don't know how many people actually want to deal thing, do things with water. That if, if you're going down into a watery place, I see how this would be the issue. But who, who wants to? But I don't know. I'm currently running a campaign about uh catching pirates 
<laughs> so I guess that's me. I don't think I want to put an apolith in that one. Maybe. Maybe somebody, my player is going to get a new friend. Mr. Squishy. I, I think I agree with you on that, that maybe um, maybe part of the issue is that like you really do need a specific sort of campaign, but D&D, &D, like, I don't know, at least the way that we end up playing it a lot, has a specific walking around uh, medieval Europe or not knights, but knight adjacent. And like this <laughs> creature that lurks in the water, <laughs> even just being uh, the fact that it's by the water makes it hard for uh, to have that connection point. Which shouldn't be too terrible, uh, especially with how often your characters can end up in the Underdark. But like, aside, besides that, like that vibe that we talked about of like, it is the inevitable. Strange creature that you are going to want to talk to, to gain an edge. Um, really could have that like mastermind vibe with its mind control powers uh, and charming powers and that like maybe every issue that you deal with is like this army of other things and things that are actually more powerful than it but it just has a great way of manipulating group to work for it It's hard to like oppose this big evil uh, or this like little guy, even if you are like a powerful whatever creature. Mostly because not only do you have to fight it, but you have to fight it underwater with all its goons after you fought in its other goons to even get there. I wonder if other like water creatures just look at it and just like, yeah, I don't really care about you. And then they look at all of its like underlings, all these land-based underlings, and it's just like, ah, weird land dwellers <laughs> falling for the abolist tricks. I'm just messing with that. Well, it still can like mind control regardless of what are you, whatever you are. It'd be weird to find out that like. Just all the ocean is under the sway of the abolith in one way or another. <laughs> yeah, you thought wrong. 
they're the just general <laughs> i don't know corrupt banking system i think it would um i think unfortunately it would lend itself to like easy um what's it called uh it would kind of discredit the seriousness of your campaign if like that's what you were aiming for but you could one storyline you could try to conceive of is um the aboleth kind of just being like a regional boss of like an under like an underwater mafia or something and the kraken is like the the dawn <laughs> yeah so this, <laughs> this kraken's got all these aboleths kind of um going out and just kind of like you know creating this um this underwater network and your heroes could always think like oh, okay so it's a bunch of these abolists that are kind of working together to make like do this coalition thing and then very slowly you know they just see in the darkness like just this inky dark you know this inky cloud just like get closer and just like ah oh, fuck <laughs> we we done messed up you guys <laughs> All of our detective work was wrong. The clues were there, we just didn't see it. Enter the final boss. Dun dun dun. Neat. The thing I was thinking when I was like reading about this is that they make a lot of creatures have this like connection to psionic powers and like when the when the world was young, these things ruled supreme and blah blah blah. Um and I've never fully gotten a good, um, I guess, cosmological understanding of how psionic powers works <laughs> in the world. But it'd be kind of interesting that even though their psionic powers are still relatively formidable, like maybe psionics in general are not that powerful um or as powerful as they could be like they um because they're drawing on the raw not charisma but like power of like an individual and their ability to manipulate the mind like the world through their own thought but not tapping into the arcane uh arcana or divine like weave of the world but maybe that's because when the gods took over and establish the like whatever arcane powers and then the like the easy key of divine powers given to um to bypass all that or manipulate that without specific things like maybe they like sapped away the potential of what are uh uh psionic powers could be or are so maybe there's like now there's just too much red tape of <gasps> arcane and divine <laughs> that's making these guys weaker. I could see that. We gotta watch your dramatic ass sneezes. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I don't want my inner ears to be destroyed. Unlike all those weird people out there that think that if they can suppress their sneeze and not have something go wrong. Now I gotta deal with them three years later. Can you hand me the mustard? What? I said, can you hand me the mustard? I just... Why is it doing that? That's weird. Oh, I didn't mirror that. Oops. Oopsie pooples. How long is a is a normal Bob Ross 
show. Hour. Right. Do forty-five minute things. I to think if you could finish stuff in that amount of time. Well, because I was thinking, like, if he, like, if his format is a viable thing to do for like three D artists, but. I don't think even even to like a, even to like the people like the the amazing people like in the profession I don't think it I, th I it takes them much longer than an hour to even do like a like to be happy with their base model <laughs> mm -hmm. like let alone get to the point where they get to start to add like fine detail and then color and stuff so Lies and I'm, I'm gonna say it. Uh, a lot of what Bob Ross does is it's a gimmick of how he does things. Like he's talented, I give it to him. Uh, he works really quick. It is hard to do that, but there is he's making he makes a lot of things that are not very specific, that are generalized things, and he pulls off a lot of cheap tricks that make that give the illusion of things like he deals more in like the illusion of designs rather than like full-fledged like finished works so i don't know there's a, there's a lot about his work that even i can see when i'm like i've done and followed his, his stuff before and like done a tutorial but looked through it and like oh that's like that's actually a kind of not all that great um, but zoomed out and the whole effect looks good. So I like from a, a sculpting basis, I think that's harder to do, or it becomes more obvious the kind of, um, the kind of effect that it is like shortcuts and sketchy and stuff like that. Cause that's one thing that I kind of wanted to try to do, but like it's weird trying to translate one medium, like the way one medium is portrayed into a different medium. Cause it's kind of like trying to do the same techniques. It's like, t it's like trying to apply high jumping techniques to full vault. It's like, you can kind of do that, but they're very different things. <laughs> so like football to soccer or yeah, like some, like baking stuff to like... using a microwave. <laughs> yeah, the, the first the first time that I really got to experience that was when um, the basketball team sent over their players off seat like their off season players to our high jump pit, and we mm. were just like, oh, okay, you know, basketball players, they should be able to. to to totally like destroy us and everything because you know they're able to actually reach that hoop and stuff and i don't think any of us could knock the bar over like every single time we were just like what's going on here is this the twilight zone Oh, you know what? I should be targeting not the crease itself, but the flab on the edge, I guess. No. That's not working as well as I thought it would. What's this? Multi-plane scrape. Maybe that's what I need to use. I haven't used this tool yet. What does this do? Oh. Practice. Oh, that's weird. And not the tool that I need for this particular job. <laughs> or at least from what I'm witnessing from it. Pinch. It's funny for, oh, like, if somebody it's really knowledgeable or at least knowledgeable in that tool is like yeah no that's exactly what you want what the hell are you doing why are you doing that <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, you don't use it like ah, oh, God, just. I would welcome that right now. <laughs> Oh, uh, what the heck? Yeah, it's because it's off. It's off kilter, I'm sure. That's weird, though. It should have. Hmm. Weird. Um. Okay, so we're we're twelve hours into the hour, or we're twelve minutes into the hour. So, um. Where you at? How you feeling? You still got some? You still need to finish up some? Still need to finish up some stuff, or? I could still doodle some if you want, but. Okay. I was kind of thinking that like maybe something that we should do, um, or that you could we could do, is come at this with like half made stuff, and do like final touches on this, unless you really enjoy the, um, starting from scratch part of it. Like, I like sketching. I know I have a lot of little finishing works. I wonder if that would be more amusing. I see that it's trying. Yeah, I mean, one of the things... Um, that's one of the things that I was hoping eventually is that the more comfortable we get with this, then um, we can try to get closer and closer to more of a finished product. Um, I, I mean I, I start from scratch just because that's that helps me that helps me force myself to um, actually like you know practice all the little things but I can see how unsatisfying it would be to see <laughs> to see one person just kind of get to a less than halfway point and then just be like all right that's the hour, gentlemen, so <laughs> I'll hope to see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like part of that's part of like the whole thing for some people is seeing where th things start, but I don't know how much I don't know at this moment. I'm kind of liking this nasty thing that I'm creating. Um, but how much I really want to like finish this in particular. I think is a little bit strange. Um, like, as much as I love na uh, drawing that nasty Aarakorkra, I don't think I'm gonna finish that guy. <laughs> Ooh, doesn't like that. If it was already like partially finished, like maybe, maybe I could force myself to do it on this stream. I always make I always make one small detail at the uh, one small mistake at the beginning, and it kind of like ruins the thing for the rest of the thing, for the rest of the <laughs> hour that I'm sitting here. <laughs> like, I kind of started to make this guy off kilter, and so I had to rotate some stuff, and now all my axes are like off. Um, so now my mirror modifiers don't exactly work correctly. <laughs>
Jasper got its glasses and it's like typing. <laughs> I think that's what my creature looks like. <laughs> Doesn't know how to quite type right. Like, history. What is this new world gods. with this computer? This is totally probably what they're like. I need here, human, come to the water. What is your typing speed? Mm, I guess that'll do. I'm going to have to eat you so that I can log on to my AOL. <laughs> like my tail is pathetic because theoretically I probably should have just made it an entirely different thing and just added it on like I did the mooth which I'm surprised at how simple I did the mouth but how well it looks like it's better than what I would have done if I were to just try to be like I'm gonna make a blob and then I'm just gonna kind of hollow it out and then I'm gonna make teeth from it I wish I could do more with the quote unquote gills though so let's see if I can add just a little more <laughs> ah. Oh no, I hate it even more that it's larger. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. 
Let's go to Eldric Horror Colors. <laughs> Heavy, smoky nastiness. It's weird. I keep wanting to believe, like, I, I made the body a little too long, so I hmm. always want to believe that there's, like, an arm or something, like a, uh, like a pectoral fin or something that I'm missing. You could add that. You could add that. I saw an artwork or two that added a pectoral fin. I like the idea. Especially if this is like some deep sea thing. That lingers forever. In a world of grossness. In a world of grossness. Coveting your mind and the secrets that it holds. The Aboleth. Mm -hmm. only got gills on one side <laughs> I'll just manually do it then while I got the time then instead of using the crease tool I can try the pinch tool and see if that's better That zoomed in version is not is not good. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. I'm happier with this one. Think about my done point. gills together Touch some gills see if that makes it any better than the pinch tool or the crease tool makes it look a little more interesting it smooths out things a lot though let's supplement with the pinch tool Interesting. I can kind of see the differences now. All right. I think pinch first, then crease. <laughs> yields of more. Yields a more thingamabobber. I'm angry because eventually I want to be able to zip through all through all the design so I can add bones and make these things move. <laughs> Ow, my hand. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we should think of other things to throw in, but it's hard because 
I get into I eventually I slide into a I slide into a focus mode and all sort of like all sort of like meta games and um interesting fact just kind of go out my head. This one's anatomy. It was kind of like weird for me. It's like their lack of anatomy at certain points. I think like my last two drawings made more sense for me, so that was helpful to be able to draw. But I, I feel you that the, the that focus mode kicked in of like, what the hell is this? Okay. Um. So what's next? Maybe. I don't know, we start thinking of like other things, like an action that it does, uh, a place that it lives. I guess I could think of those out, and you can focus on your creature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, should also try to do one where one of us or both of us decide to pre-work on it and then on Sunday finish it and just be like all right this is my phoenix <laughs> mm -hmm. Ooh. we're going alphabetically and I guess we can each choose which one uh and going by the like the standard like monster manual it's angels oh no <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there's a lot of different ones there's the devas there's the um, planetars, there's the solars, and if we go, if we want to go, like, follow the main book, but then look into the other books and see what other angels they have, we could. But I guess, I don't know, are we just doing a vanilla monster manual, or are we doing, like, with Mordenkainen's and uh, Polo's guide? <laughs> I don't know how up to date yours your thing is, but mine goes mine goes Aboleth, Abominable Yeti, even though technically I'd place that under Yeti still, Yeti comma abominable. <laughs> and then there's the abyssal chicken. <laughs> oh, what are you what the fuck are you on? You're just looking through D and D why. Beyond? Yeah, because they added um their newest book, um, Descent into Avernus. They're um oh. like the hellscape thing but interesting I don't, I don't have that book so i don't have access to that chicken so we can <laughs> just kind of move on oh, angels uh Medible yeti getting there then we go into the adult class. So there's adult black dragon, blue, <laughs> brown. Nah, that's dragons. Those are still dragons. Um, and then D and D Beyond likes to give me a adult, adult, adult. What the hell is that? Something from a book I don't have. What's the name? Aoran Absorber. Mm. Guide to Wild Mount. Guide to Wild Mount. A noun. Oh, everything that's happening in uh, Roll 20 area. What the heck is uh, nothing? Um, A H M A E R G O. Never heard of it. So, are we expanding our horizons, or are we going following a vanilla set? I don't know, but there's also the air elemental. Do you count that as an elemental? It depends if we want to do, cause like, if we think about the book. The book goes, uh, elementals as a whole is in, like, the, L the E area of elementals. But that means that we have that we're going to do several elementals in a row. We're going to do our own, uh, whichever elemental we find interesting out of the elemental group. And that sets this precedent for things like this, like angels, where there's, at least in the monster manual, listed three different types of angel angels. And then, like, when we get to demons or dragons, yeah, we're going to do, think, do you want to do each one or just whichever one appeals to you? Uh, I don't know. We could do... 
So in Volo's Guide to Monsters that I actually do have, there's a thing called an Alhoon. But it doesn't have an image for me to look at. So we could actually do some artistic life. Alhoon? A-L-H-O-O-N. The kind of mind flayer, I think. Medium undead. It's a dead any, one. Any a lich. alignment. Yeah, it is. Huh, interesting. Mind flayers that pursue arcane magic are exiled as deviants and for then no eternal communication. Oh. I guess they would go under... Weird that they're Bullshit. considered undead. All right, how about the Al 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 <laughs> I don't know what that is. Al oh, oh, it's a, never mind. I know what it is. <laughs> it's kind of it's just weird, kind of a weird. An alkalith is easily mistaken for some kind of foul fungal growth that appears on doorways, windows, and other portals. Oh. These dripping infestations conceal the demonic nature of the alkalith. Making what you should could be make a, a dire difference. warning appear strange, but otherwise innocuous. Weird. Could do that. <laughs> That's kind of easy for me. Well, relatively easy. I just have to make a doorway look interesting. <laughs> and then I have to make a fungal growth look gross. So, ooh, that gives me practice in my textures. I could practice my texture stuff. Make stuff look slimy. Or super dry or metallic. Um, so that's AL. Um, have you ever heard of an ALIP? A L L I P? Yeah. It's kind of something different. I can't remember if that falls into a specific category. When a mind uncovers it, well, uh, medium, undead, neutral, evil. Looks kind of like a shadow, actually. When a mind mm. uncovers a secret that is a powerful being, uh, that a powerful being has protected with a mighty curse, the result is often the emergence of an ellip. Secrets protected in this manner range in scope from a demon lord's true name to the hidden truths of cosmic order. The Alip acquires the secret, but the curse annihilates its body and leaves behind a spectral creature composed of fragments from the victim's psyche and overwhelming psychic energy. So I guess it could technically look like anything. So it's like, what do you think? What do you think? I read up on those kind of recently, and at least one reason, one great curse as to why they uh, exist. We could explore the curse or curses that we think are interesting and what kind of alip would be created from that. Yeah, what do you think what do you think your mind would give birth to if you learned a great cosmic secret? <laughs> Mine would look kind of like like a like a beanie baby, but its eyes would be red and <laughs> its fur would be made of metal needles. <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> Insidious lore. Um, All right, let's do the Aleph next time. Okay, Seems. you don't want to do you don't want to do demonic fungal doorways. You can do that. Isn't that? I mean, does that fall into demons? Fiend. So yeah. Alkaline. Again, that raises that question. We do creatures by their names, or do we do them by categories? Well, yeah. So, like the like the air elemental, right? So that would that would be that would be tackled when we're in elemental, because it would be elemental comma air. <laughs> that would be fiend, um, a uh, nasty door. Well, no, so. kind of so like the dwarves for example like those are those are humanoid right so but we would do those under the d okay then 
the alkalif is an A. I don't know. I'm curious at how you're going to do something like the elf alkalif or the air elemental. <laughs> something that doesn't have like big solid structures. Uh Probably have to dip into my my physics engines. <laughs> Could make a dust dust cloud. <laughs> yeah, how will I do those? All right, so let's do an alkalith next time, because that's that's easier for me, and I get to prep my mind for what I want to do for a psychic creature <laughs> for a psychic born creature for the next the next time after that so an alkalith so we're looking for some sort of we're looking for some sort of a uh, portal like a doorway or a windowsill and then um, we have to decide what's what's uh, what's a demonic fungal growth in our mind and try to do that alrighty so um, nice. and next week I will I will be more on top of like actually doing social media and stuff so that there's uh, more notice on when we're doing these things and what we're doing oh actually um, I might be out of town next week next cool. week Okay, I'll give you. We'll, we'll get that figured out, and then we'll post it online. Yeah. So if not, if not next week, which would be the twenty sixth, then we would do it on the fur on the second. Oh, slightly. Okay. <laughs>